Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the School Town of Munster School Board of Trustees. Uh, let the roll call, call show that all members of the board are present, as well as Dr. Hendricks, Mr. Trippenfelders, Mr. Melby, and Dr. Stokes, as well as School Board Attorney Angie Jones. At this time, I'd like us all to rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public item 1.4, public comments. Uh, if you would like to make a public comment, there are cards to fill out. Uh, Deb Hayes, should be get, those should be given to Deb Hayes. She just raised her hand. Please keep in mind that public comments are limited to three minutes. Um, item two, I'm turning the meeting over to our superintendent for a very special presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Wells, Ms. McClary, would you please come forward? celebrate someone who has gone above and beyond the call of duty, so to speak, or who's volunteered or supported our schools or our community in such a way. And uh, I'm going to have Mr. Wells do a little bit more explaining about why you are receiving this honor tonight, Lois. So I'll let him talk about it for a minute. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. So uh, uh, board members, I passed out some articles from 1980 about the fire at Munster High School. And as the story go, goes, on October 11th, 1980, the media center at Munster High School and both lecture halls burned down. And it took over 60 firefighters over four hours of time to put out the blaze that was uh, pretty much destroyed the media center and the lecture halls. Uh, later on, after reconstruction was finished in 1981, a call went out uh, to the community uh, for volunteers to put the media center back together. And Lois McClory was one of those volunteers in 1981 who stepped up to the challenge put out by the board and central office administration. And Lois has been volunteering at Munster High School for over 40 years now, uh, totaling 15,000 hours of volunteer service, which equates to almost two full years of volunteering. And for that, we want to thank you, Lois, for your hard work and your volunteerism at Munster High School. We have, a couple, we have a couple of things to honor you for that tonight. We have a, a little certificate we framed for you. And we have this golden apple. So you can put it on your desk or somewhere at your home if you prefer. But just a little token of I mean, I don't know how we can repay you, but this is just something that's honoring you tonight, so. I hope to continue. Well, we'd like to honor uh, you. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Hendricks, okay. Um, item 2.2, we have a Munster Education Foundation grant presentation by Mrs. Tricia Shelton. Thank you. Help yourself. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the Munster Education Foundation, it is my pleasure to award five grants for the school town of Munster. 
This is the third cycle of grants for this school year, bringing the total amount awarded this year to over $35,000. This cycle's grant recipients are Laura Potchkin, fifth grade teacher at Eads Elementary on behalf of the entire school, which will benefit from a visit from author Peter Brown, who wrote The Wild Robot. This grant will help further the school's <coughs> One School, One Book initiative. Our second grant goes to Thomas Kamak on behalf of the Wilbur Wright English Language Arts Department. This grant for $645 supports subscriptions for the supplemental digital programs Quizlet and Storyboard, which will benefit 700 students. Our next recipient is Katie Brown Boyle for the Munster High School Speech and Debate Program. This grant of $2,000 will be used for equipment to support the virtual speech and debate tournaments. Another grant of $2,000 will be awarded to Ray Pallas, the Auditorium Director for Munster High School. These funds will be put towards a Mac Mini to be used with the recently purchased digital soundboard. This new equipment will enhance the capabilities of the students to create and edit sound effects for all theater productions. Our last grant from this cycle is awarded to Alicia Lasky for Munster High School's Student Transition Education Program. This grant in the amount of $541 will be used to purchase life skills educational materials. This will be used for the young adults in the program to gain skills needed for successful adulthood living. Congratulations to all of our grant recipients and to the students of School Town of Munster who will benefit from these new or supporting initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. At this time, anybody that wants to uh, step out uh, after these presentations, uh, welcome to step out and uh, we'll give it a moment here before we continue on with our program. I think we're good. All right, item three, the consent agenda. Mr. Trippenfelders. Mr. Doherty, the consent agenda contains items 3.1 which is viewed on the screen, which is the minutes of the regular meeting of the school uh, board on March 8, 2021, as presented. It includes item 3.2, the approval of the accounts payable voucher register, as presented. The approval of the payroll voucher register, as presented. And item 3.4, the personnel report, as presented. Any questions for Mr. Trippenfelders? Do you have a recommendation, Mr. Trippenfelders? The want administration to go through recommends that the board approve with one motion and one vote consent agenda items 3.1 through and including 3.4 as presented. John Castro, I move we, that we approve the consent agenda as presented. We're on a Stojic second. Any discussion, Mr. Trippenfelders? The one thing I did want to mention was, uh, if you notice that Mr. Brown is uh, re resigning and retiring from the Boys Cross Country coach at Munster High School, I wanted to acknowledge him for as many years of service, Mr. Doherty, as you know. Right. He's been a cross country coach for many years. And we just if it isn't 35 years, it's, yeah. it's 34. <laughs> yeah. We want to thank him for that. So uh, that's one one remiss. He's still going to be teaching, but uh, we want to give up the coach. And it's one I wanted to recognize. but. Other than that, that's really what I want to make sure we acknowledge him for those many years of service. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Item 4.1, donations. Mr. Trippenfellas. The donations include the ones presented on the uh, document you see presented. Um, many from Munster High School, if you'll see, there are several from uh, the Booster Club, uh, First Savings Bank of Hedgewick, uh, Patrick and Margaret Carraher, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Margraf and Clyde Spildy, Our Hoop, uh, B. LeVan, and G.N.D. Zeal. Um, as you can see, those as presented. Uh, looks like it's going speech and debate, stand, project decks, more for speech and debate, athletics, choir, and softball. So the administration recommends that the board approve the, don uh, the donations as presented. 
Is there a motion then to approve the donations as presented? Schwartz Wolf, so moved. Higgison, second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Fundraisers, item 4.2, Mr. Trippenfelders. The fundraisers, there are two sets we'd like to present uh, for approval. The first is from Wilbur Wright Middle School, uh, which shows that uh, the Wilbur Wright Middle School volleyball team is going to be doing uh, an open gym um, for fundraising purposes. And then from the high school, uh, we have theater, girls tennis. And the one I did want to highlight, and I can't believe as a former high school principal, I'm even excited to say this, but junior CEC and senior CEC selling prom tickets. All right. Uh, football uh, for next season, speech debate for next season as well. And the administration recommends that the board approve the fundraisers as presented. Do I hear a motion then to approve R as presented? Ron Stojic, so move. Se second. Castro, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Res item number 4.3, resolution 821, the resolution opposing education savings accounts and voucher expansion. Uh, <laughs> this was read at uh, last month's board meeting. Would uh, board members care to hear it again? Uh, all right. I'll ask for a motion then to approve resolution number 821, opposing education savings accounts and voucher expansion is being considered down in Indianapolis by the legislature as presented. John hey. Castro, I move we approve resolution 821 as presented. Higgison, second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Item number 4.4, public hearing and resolution number 822, resolution of the school board confirming the ninth amendment to high school lease and approving the issuance of bonds and related matters. Mr. Quackenbush. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Hendricks, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Jeff Quackenbush and Barb and Thornburg. Tonight, we are having the public hearing on the amendment to lease that we preliminarily approved and presented to you all back on March 8th. On March 9th, we published a notice of that public hearing that listed all the financing parameters and lease payments. Let me just summarize for you, those for you briefly, and then at that point, we'll open it up for any public comment. After the public comment, you can close the public hearing and you can consider resolution uh, 422 and 423 as well. So the financing parameters are as follows. The project that we're intending to finance will be primarily the media center renovation and update uh, for the high school. There's some significant drainage issues that have to be dealt with there, and so there's some costs associated with that. If there's funds left over after that project is bid, we would also look at doing some of the heating and air conditioning work at the high school, and then looking at other projects uh, around the district that might be needed that are further on down that list as we would go as funds would be available. The total cost of this project is $5,575,000. It would be financed with bonds issued by the building corporation. Uh, the term of those bonds are a maximum term not to exceed six years, but in the current interest rate environment, we think it could be done in around three to three and a half years. So significant about half the time that we are anticipating as the maximum parameter. The lease payment that was adopted as the maximum lease payment would be $2,863,000. That's not every year, that's probably just in one or two of those years. What we're doing is we're wrapping around the existing financings that the, the, the school corporation and the building corporation have in place. So that this will be tax rate neutral. Um, if the board approves this this evening, we would then have a notice of execution published in the local paper. That would run for 30 days, at which time someone could challenge the validity of the process that we went through, not the determinations made by the school board or by the building corporation. We are currently looking at uh, selling these bonds probably in August or early September of this year after the construction bids come back in. They're still working on some of the design work associated with the media center. They anticipate getting that done late this spring, early summer, and then after we get those bids back in, that's when we'll sell the bonds. But at this point in time, we do believe the interest rates continue to stay very uh, vibrant and stay at, that, at those lower levels, even though you're seeing some uh, aspects of U.S. Treasury rates go up with the announcement uh, from, the, from the Biden infrastructure plan that uh, capital tax rates 
might go up, by, our corporate tax rate might go up by 5%. That's causing some renewed interest in municipal bonds and technical bonds like this. So we continue to expect that to be good through the remainder of the summer and into the fall. So with that, if you have to answer any questions anyone may have about the presentation or about the projects, if you don't have any, then we should open it up for public. And questions for Mr. Quackenbush? Are there any uh, comments from anybody present? Mr. Quackenbush, I'll just, I'll just ask, even, even with the, the ongoing discussions and the infrastructure plans, and, and again, that, that's always going to create some semblance some, of some volatility, um, there's still going to be an expectation for demand come August, September. Absolutely. Supply right now is extremely low in the market and will continue to stay that way. And so uh, what we're seeing is that there's some renewed interest that maybe wasn't there a month or two ago in the tax exempt market because taxable rates were moving up, so people were moving their monies over to treasuries. Um, with, the, with the announcement of corporate tax rates potentially going up and other tax rates going up, we've seen in the last two weeks the municipal market has actually spread to be uh, better against treasuries than when they were a month ago. Thank you. Very well. Is there a motion then to approve resolution number 822, resolution of the school board confirming the Ninth Amendment to the high school lease and approving the issuance of the bonds and related matters as presented? Schwartzwolf, so moved. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> motion carries 5 0. Resolution number 823 of the school board approving the additional appropriation and related matters. Mr. Quackenbush. So this resolution is the appropriation resolution. Just like in your budget, anytime you spend money, you have to have an appropriation in place in your budget. But because you don't include bond issues in your budget, we have an additional appropriation process. So this notice was also published back on March 9th as a part of the aggregate notice that we published. We have in this public hearing this evening, and then if the board adopts the additional appropriation resolution, then we will file that report down with the Department of Local Government Finance. This resolution does not require the approval of the state like your normal budget does because it's not from a fund from which property taxes are received. So this is the last step in that process after you approve this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Quackenbush. Is there a motion then to approve resolution number 823, resolution of the school board approving the additional appropriation and related matters as presented? Higginson, so moved. Ron Stojic, second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. <laughs> Item number 4.6. Thank you, Mr. Quackenbush. Thank you, Thank Thank you. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Item number 4.6, the Chartwell's contract renewal, Mr. Melby. Uh, yes, so uh, as you see in the contract, it would be a modest, uh, Very modest increase of approximately 3%. To remind you of the process, Chartwell's, they meet with us and we go over the renewal. After that, we send the uh, renewal to the Department of Education. Uh, actually, Cynthia Harris is a person that approves it from there. So the DOE approves it. Then it comes back to us. Then we need the board to approve it. That's what we're looking to do now. Uh, once we get the signatures, we send it back to the uh, Department of Education for a final approval. <coughs> so uh, the administration recommends that the board approve the third <coughs> renewal out of four for the Chart Wells Food Service contract. Do I hear a motion then to approve the dispose? I'm sorry to, to approve the Chart Chart Wells renewal contract as presented. Castro, I move we approve the chart wells renewal as presented. Schwartzwolf, second. Is there any other discussion? Just a quick question. Obviously, we're, we've continued to be satisfied with chart wells and the uh, relationship we have with them, uh, especially considering this was a pretty challenging year. I know food service generally had to really um, kind of change everything they were doing. Um, and, you know, I, I know early on you expressed support and uh, gratitude for, for how they were going about their business. Yes, as I said at several of the meetings, I think Chartwells has really stepped up to uh, provide for our community uh, with the, the pickup meals on Wednesdays. Uh, we're going to, the plan is to continue that through the summer, uh, even when school is not in session and we are profitable as well. Uh, and you will hear during my financial report some other things that Chartwells is working with us on that are helping the school district as well. Thank you. 
Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Now number item 4.7, disposal of curricular consumables and materials. Mr. Melby. Uh, you may remember this from two years ago. Again, material, when we have a new textbook adoption, some of the materials that we have become obsolete. There's no reason for us to, they're unusable by us. So uh, textbooks, teacher editions, and so on. Instead of throwing those things away, our plan is to uh, have Allied Book Company come and collect those. We log everything that, that's there. There's a price per book, per manual, per everything uh, that's there. Then we receive that money back. It is not a large portion of money. Last time we did this, it was under $1,000. Uh, but it, it did serve a purpose of getting the old books out of the school system and having some value with it as well. And this is a state mandated process, isn't it? No, sir. Uh, the State Board of Accounts doesn't ask for this? It's not mandated. This is just an extra way where we can recoup some money instead of just throwing unusable things away. You can't, again, in schools, you can't throw things away unless you document that. This is another way of documentation. It's going and we're getting a, a feedback for it. Thank you, Mr. Melby. I'll so the administration recommends that the board approve the Allied Book Company for usable, unusable books and materials. Do I hear a motion then to appro approve the disposal of curricular consumables and materials 2021 as presented? Ron Stojic, so moved. Castro, second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries 5-0. Dr. Hendricks, are there any other items that may properly come before the board? We do not have any at this time. All right, item number 6.1, textbook fees for the 2021-2022 school year. Dr. Stokes. Yes, um, we have textbook fees for the fiscal year 2 will have a credit so we've been working really diligently to make sure that we have a process in place whereby teachers and our principals look at the resources that we need um, and make sure that what we're charging parents is fair and equitable in terms of what students will actually be using so for K through 5 um, all book fees did appear to, to reduce when you look at the middle school fees they are um, for most classes they are the same there are some classes where there might be a slight uptick in the fee because of some of the resources that teachers are needing to utilize um, with students. COVID taught us some things that, you know, was valuable in some ways when it comes to curricular. There were actually some resources that are online that are actually more usable and that connect better with students. And so there have been some changes in the middle school fees. When we think about our high school fees, we actually had um, a few new classes this year. As you're aware, one of our new classes is the entrepreneurship class that we're having at the secondary level. So that will be a fee that we did not have in the past for students who are, who are um, experiencing the entrepreneur and new venture course. But it is a nominal fee of $25. Uh, most of the fee charge will probably be in the way of donations in terms of in terms of business partnering and startups. Um, so the fees at the high school and some of our advanced courses, the fees did go up a little bit. Um, for example, in some of the interactive fifth level art courses, for example, but this is more personalized art settings for our students. 
And so these are just the fee costs that we present. And if you so, we'll look at that the next year, next month. I hope that we will be able to approve the fees. Any questions at this time for Dr. Stokes? Dr. Stokes, I just have one general question because every year, right around, you know, when it's time to register, it, inevitably we get questions about fees. This is ridiculous. This is a public school. Why do I have to pay fees? Why do we have these fees? Would you care to just address in general why there are fees so people can understand better why there are textbook fees, why there are consumable fees, why there are extra fees that, even though this is a public school district, that mm -hmm. sometimes there's a little extra that we have to pay? Okay, sure, I'll be glad to address that question. So fees are typically generated in two ways, what we call curricular resources and what we call consumables. Curricular resources are those types of resources that we typically may adopt from a publisher. For example, Pearson or Savas, we adopted, our English department had a new adoption this year. And we typically look at the, the number of books that we need to have for students. In many of our high school courses, for example, we just give classroom sets, but we give online access which is equal to like having your own book that you could have a hardback. We provide hardbacks in the classrooms for students in case they still want to have a hardback or need it. You know, they break their fingers or legs or something, you know, and they need a hardback book. We have those available. Um, so that is a curricular charge. It's typically the price of a, renting a book, and it may be, you know, $15, $20 for that particular class. Then there's what's called a consumable charge. The consumable charge is usually something like a workbook or like in art classes, things that you manipulate that you may get to keep, paintbrushes, things of that nature. Um, so our book fees are made up of the course materials that students will need to utilize in particular classes. And as you can imagine, the more techy a class becomes, the possibility that the fee could be a little bit more. We typically try to work with our superintendent, Dr. Hendricks, to make sure that we max fees out at certain points. And I'll explain what I mean by that. For example, when we had some elementary fees that could quite honestly be $75 for a particular language arts book, but we, we, we won't charge 75. He has the authority to max that out at maybe 50. So there are things that we don't always charge the full price for because we don't want to pass that cost on to parents. So we max out at certain points. But that is essentially why we do have book fees because of the actual resources students need to utilize in the classroom. I think um, what Mr. Castro might have been asking too is um, in some states, they don't have to pay book fees. Not in Indiana. But not in, and I think that's <laughs> the point. Yeah, and yes. I think that might have been what he was asking as well is why in Indiana, um, and Indiana is one of the states where we do actually have to assess book fees and those go back to, to the, parents, the, the guardians. Yeah, yeah that, that has been a question that's come up probably about every year from every those year. folks Forever. who move over from Illinois. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They seem to must they must pay for everything over there. But uh, and it's possible that Michigan or some other state might be doing some of that as well. But in Indiana, we are allowed to do this to reduce the burden on the state yeah and some of that has been because of the term FAPE F-A-P-E free and appropriate public education parents will say it's not free if I have to pay for it um, and so that the, the term FAPE has also been some of the discrepancy in terms of you know why parents believe they shouldn't have to pay for book fees but in Indiana you're, you're very much right the state legislators do allow us to charge Mm -hmm. um, one more concern that since we're on the subject, and I know this doesn't have to do with the fees, but do parents always have the opportunity to purchase a hard co copy? I know there have been problems for s a small segment, but parents have asked previously because they want to keep a book at home, they don't want their child to go back and forth with a heavy book, or they only have books in the classroom and they don't want to have to use always be on the computer screen. Do we give parents an opportunity to do that? We haven't given parents that opportunity. We do have set. So if there is ever a situation where a parent feels like it is in their best interest to have it, they can speak with the building principal and we'll try and make that happen. Okay. Thank you. And the other part, uh, Dr. Wolf, is the fact that we would know how many to order. And right. usually over a period of uh, these, these are rented out over, what, six years? Mm -hmm. Four so, or six. So we spread the cost out based off of a six year rental, but we wouldn't know how many to order. So if somebody walked in, we wouldn't may not have an extra laying around that you just buy off the shelf like a college or university. 
but a parent can't contact that company and say, I want to buy this $75 book, send it to what me. What I would recommend is that if a parent has a, a special need and it's a case-by-case -case situation, they could let the principal know. And if they don't, if we deem that we don't have an extra, you know, like we have so many overflow mm -hmm. that we need, if we can't give one of our extras, they can typically contact me and I work hand in hand with the vendors and the vendors okay. can typically get one for us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Stokes? All right. Uh, item number 6.2, the board meeting schedule for 2021-2022. Uh, just a point of information that we'll vote on next meeting. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions on that? So I'll move on right away to item 7.1, uh, the financial report, Mr. Melby. Well, I'll start since I, uh, Mr. Castro asked. <clears throat> We're always trying to find ways to supplement uh, our revenue. Uh, we are working with Chartwells right now uh, on an energy innovation grant uh, that where we were hoping to get a walk-in freezer at the high school. Uh, we're also working on another grant to possibly reconfigure the lines at the middle school uh, for uh, to help with social distancing as well as it's been a long time since those have been uh, renovated. So uh, again, Chartwells has gone above and beyond, in my opinion, on working and trying to do the little things, not only for our community, but also to make it financially sound for us as well. If you look in the education fund, uh, there are a couple uh, points to notice. The first thing is you would notice the uh, non-certified uh, payroll did go up more than what you would normally think. Uh, again, the reason for that, this is one of the first times in a long time that we've actually had every day somebody working. There are, were no e-learning days, there were no vacations and so on. So that's what, uh, if that was up and you didn't understand why, that's the reason. Uh, if you go down to payments of the co-op, uh, remember that is for our career center at the Hammond, so that, that is what that payment is for there. The other points that I want to point out is we did uh, slightly increase increase our cash balance in the education fund and like I, we try to look at this in many different ways throughout the year but we're basically one-fourth of the way through the year uh, all of our expenditures if you add it all up it's at 24 percent of our total approved appropriation so we do track it obviously 20 25 is where we should be at about approximately right now we're not way over and we're underneath that which is good uh, if you go to the operations fund you will see a considerable increase in mobile and fixed equipment. Uh, some of the big items in there, we did have a teacher insight tool uh, that was purchased as well as Connex West containers. That's why the increase there in maintenance and repair. The biggest uh, uh, point of that number going up was the dance floor uh, that was um, ruined or with the leak over it and we will receive some money back from insurance after so that's where that big hit came from doing the same thing through the three months here we've only uh compared to our appropriations uh spent 19 percent and you may think that's a little bit lower uh but we do have projects that we know we're going to be doing during the summer and that's going to increase that uh number tremendously as well as we have buses that we're going to be purchasing in the later part of this uh year so don't be fooled about that 19 percent we have uh, uh met much of that appropriations handled for in the referendum fund there's really nothing uh to point out that's out of the ordinary but again if you compare the three months to the entire year we're up over 28 percent and again that would be a red flag for us but remember we did have that large payment for the insurance property liability in January which we knew would skew the numbers so we are tracking it and the percentage is getting better as the year goes on um, but everything is right where we thought it would be right on schedule so uh, that's the financial report any questions from mr. Melby thank you very much bill I number 8.1 assistant superintendents reports mr. trip fellas not much for me this month. I wanted to let you know one thing. I was hoping to have the 2022-23 calendar for you guys to approve today. Unfortunately, I had some family issues and I had to be out uh, for a little bit of time. So we didn't get a chance to, I, I didn't attend the 
uh, MTA discussion, I want to be able to make sure I reviewed those notes beforehand. And I also want to meet with our principals because we're talking about a couple of other things we could do there. So I apologize for that. But I did want to make one note. The 2020-2021, which is our current school calendar, and the 2021-22 calendar, which already is approved, we are going to make a slight technical correction, correction to that, not any change to it, but we'll change it on the website. We forgot to put when summer school started. So we'll have the June date when summer school starts that goes on those calendars. It doesn't require approval because it was already one of those things we did, but we realized that they weren't on there. So we're putting it for this current uh, calendar year and then the next calendar year. And I provided those to Kurt today. Will you give me the thumbs up if you got those, Kurt? Now, not on the, not on the web, but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So we'll get those up. And he wanted, actually, he didn't get them on the web because he wanted to at least let me let you know we're making a check of correction Good first. Call. So I told him not to. It's not like he didn't do his, I just wanted to make sure he got the email. Uh, so those will be changed. And again, it's not a change to the calendar, but it's, it's just more information so our parents know when summer school actually begins and then would end as well. So I wanted to make you aware of that. And uh, only one other thing I wanted to make you aware of, it is the school hiring season so mr wells and mrs Svitkovich have already worked and we're we should be bringing three new hires to you for the next school year um so we're, we're plugging right along and i'm actually very proud of both of them because they may be some of the three hardest jobs to find and uh, they're working out and getting those done in april so you'll see some of those coming up next month and hopefully more in june um, but our staffing is moving quite well for next school year Thank you, Mr. Trippenfeld. Is Dr. Stokes any more besides yeah. textbooks? Yeah, just briefly, I wanted to share that um, Indiana um, has an accelerated learning plan that schools are expected to create in their districts, and we are working on what our accelerated learning plan will look like. Essentially, they're comparing it to that of like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where you know students have to catch up, keep up, and move up. And so in our plan, we are trying to think outside the box, think inside the box and around the box in ways that we can support students. Um, so if you see or hear conversations about middle schoolers or high schoolers having <coughs> extended learning opportunities beyond just summer school, it's because we are trying to think about ways to support our students with potential um, delays or gaps in their learning. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. Uh, Mr. Stojic, the Director of Excep Exceptional Achievers Report. This is for Ms. Ms. Spikovich. Uh, the speech celebration at EADS. The Stuttering Foundation is the first and largest nonprofit charitable organization working toward the prevention and improved treatment of stuttering. The organization provides free online resources, services, and support to those who stutter for research into the causes of stuttering. This month, a third grade student at Eads Elementary wrote a letter to the Stuttering Foundation about how he perceives stuttering and what it means to him to be a person who stutters. The student's submission to the organization was published in the winter 2021 edition of the magazine. He was so proud. The student also presented to his classmates during Kindness Week to spread stuttering awareness. The Munster Challengers welcomes athletes to register for our 2021 season. The Challenger <coughs> Baseball League was established to ena enable individuals with physical and intellectual disabilities to enjoy the game of baseball. Practices are held weekly on Thursdays at Frank H. Hammond Park in Munster. Games are held weekly on Sundays at Community Park in Munster. Parents have been provided information for their children to take part. I just want to say I've been to some of those games and those kids are so excited that you need to go out there and the faces on those kids to play baseball, to be out in the baseball field, you can't match. So some Sunday if you're not doing nothing, go over to the um, community park. I think it would be enjoyable. Thank you, Mr. Stojic. Uh, Mr. Sigerson, you have the elementary school principal's reports? Yes. Um, April's testing month. Grades K through five are completing the spring in WEA. Next week, grades three through five will start iLearn testing. At home learners are joining us for testing. All of the elementary schools will be having some form of a spring book fair to support our PTOs. Girls on the Run Club has started at all three buildings. As the weather warms up, girls will be running around our schools. End of the year activities such as DARE graduation and field days are being accommodated due to COVID restrictions. Uh, we will discuss plans with our PTO groups. We are happy to 
be using our playgrounds once again. We have cleaning protocols in place to make this happen. Eads and Elliott students are enjoying their first week on the new playground equipment that was installed last spring and summer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, Dr. Schwartz-Wolf, you have the report for the middle school? Yes, this is for Mr. Nolan. We are in the heart of the standardized testing season. After spring break, we kicked off both iLearn practice exams and our final round of NWEA testing. We are tentatively awaiting the results of the NWEA to show where we might be performing at the end of the month on iLearn. We are excited to announce that our middle school science Olympiad team came in fifth place this year at state. We are happy for the team and their efforts. A big shout out and congratulations to Brandon Walker, who made the national finals of the history B. He is the only seventh grader from Indiana to make the International Competition History Olympiad. A big nice. congratulations and good luck. Yeah. Uh, spring sports have started at Wilbur Wright. Our soccer, tennis, seventh grade football, and track and field are all up and running. Lastly, I want to give a shout out to the Wilbur Wright teachers. As we all know, it has been a very trying year, but they persevered and worked extremely hard to provide our students with their best learning. Starting in March, all core subject area teachers began meeting on a rotating schedule after school each day to work on curriculum alignment, reviewing and collecting data, and broaching some deep discussions with administration and the coaches on our curriculum and teaching practices. It has been an enriching process for our teachers that we believe will translate to higher student learning outcomes for all students. In this short process, we have already seen significant shifts in thinking on instruction and learning. We still have some significant hurdles to overcome, but getting teachers together to work on teaching has opened their eyes to the strengths as a team. I am proud of our teachers and our community. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz-Wolf. Speaking for Mr. Wells is Mr. Wells. Mr. Doherty, you always do a better job than I should just hand you my paper and you can read my notes. <laughs> so recently, uh, Munster High School finished as state runner-up in Science Olympiad. Uh, we actually tied in points with Carmel High School uh, with 32 points, but we lost in the first tiebreaker, which is gold medals. Carmel had 10 gold medals and Munster had eight. So unfortunately, we finished state runners-up, but nothing to be ashamed of finishing in second place. And there was actually one, only one other school who took a gold medal. So as you can see, it was quite the battle between uh, Munster High School and Carmel. We also found out that we had two national merit winners. Uh, there's only 7,500 national merit winners throughout the state. And those two students are Shreya Iyer and Ava Kwasney. Speech and debate had 17 national qualifiers, which is the most in school's history. So we're proud of our mm -hmm. speech and debate team, as always. Yep. And finally, um, in addition to recognizing Lois here tonight, I'm kind of glad she left because we're going to be celebrating her next week, which is National <laughs> Volunteer Week, uh, with the commitment that she's given to Munster High School. And there's also an article in your packet. It's called Good Year for Munster Schools. I failed to mention this when Lois was here, but I apologize for that. But Richard McClory, who was Lois's late husband, was a school board member back in, in 1980. So I wanted to make a mention of that as well. So uh, that's the report from the high school. Thank you, Mr. Wells. In individual public comments. Uh, Deb, are there any? There are none, okay, thank you. All right, uh, ind individual board member reports. Mrs. Higgison. I just want to say that we're almost to the finish line. Um, I have nothing to report from strategic planning. I don't think we met this this month, unless I'm mistaken. Um, but we're almost to the finish line, and I honestly, it's hard to believe that we're here um, and how far we've come from August. So um, congratulations to everyone on a Absolutely. wonderful year. Thank you, Mr. Sigerson. Dr. Schwartz-Wolf. Uh, I also have nothing to report on the strategic planning committee, but we are having a meeting this month. Um, I did attend the PTO president's meeting and just a reminder that the chain of command for parents when you know they, they do have a voice the PTO represents parents and when the PTO presidents come and meet with the administration and board member 
we do hear what's going on in the schools. We get questions from the PTO presidents that were relayed from parents. So there is a communication process, and then they take that information back to the PTO. So just a reminder that monthly we are hearing from parents. Uh, I'm looking forward to speaking at Frank Hammond next Wednesday with somebody else. I'm not sure who that is yet. <laughs> Am I being voluntold? Yes. <laughs> so Mr. Castor and I will be looking forward to attending the Frank Hammond PTO meeting uh, next Wednesday. Still available for other PTOs if anyone's interested. Um, and lastly, uh, we have all been working on the community newsletter, which is in draft number three form. So hopefully, first week of May, the Munster residents will have it in their mailbox. Uh, we will also be, the PTO presidents requested that we send them a copy to make sure parents are aware that they went out, that went out to the community. And we'll be posting on social media to make sure people know, because in the past, apparently some people haven't seen it. It is a small brochure, trying not to spend too much money on it, but we feel it's very important to communicate with all Munster residents, not just parents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schwartzwald. Mr. Castro. Uh, just uh, redevelopment commission meetings on March 15th and April 5th. Uh, again, those are, those are pretty quick. I mean, usually five minute meetings, nothing really brought up. Um, just some housekeeping type of things that were um, coordinated with the regular town council meeting. But I usually sit through the regular town council meetings and this is outside of my purview, but there are some things that I discussed with uh, Mr. Doherty, our president, and uh, I informed Mr. Uh, Dr. Hendricks and Mr. Melby um, that there are some pending fees related to the water bill and uh, some waste collection things that, uh, you know, very exciting stuff, but uh, things that we'll, we'll need to discuss. And again, that's outside my purview, but just happened to be there as, at that point, a member of the town. Um, so I want to bring that up again to you guys. Um, and kind of on the heels of Dr. Schwartzwell's comments, I just want to thank our administrators, our building administrators especially, and just appreciate all the work and time and effort that you spend in your decision-making process. Um, I wanna reiterate to people that these aren't just things that you think of and, and there's a lot of thought that goes into it. There's a lot of consideration and there's a lot of data. And, and I, I know that comes from the top down especially. I know Dr. Hendricks is very big on data, on measurables, on, on models, um, on specific goals and specific reasons. You know, there's always a reason we do things um, and there's always a measurable against it. So I just wanna remind people that when, we're, when, when our building administrators are making decisions, they aren't just at their whim. There's a lot of discussion, thought, and planning that goes into them. So I just wanna thank you again for all the work that you guys do. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Mr. Stojic. The park department is excited that this year we may have a normal year. Um, the pool will be open, you know, I encourage that. The programs are out there. I encourage parents to get their kids involved in that. They're excited by, about that. And I just want to add that, you know, every day I see so much, you know, getting emails from uh, principals mm -hmm. and administrators and, and uh, other organizations that there's so much happening in this school and it doesn't happen by people just sitting idle it's not just the staff here at Munster but the parents getting involved making this as as normal as possible this past year we're in the home stretch we have May and school will be out so let's just take it home I think we had a great year under the circumstances thank you Mr. Stojic um, my comments uh, largely revolve around is my position as liaison to the Munster Education Foundation. And it is with great pleasure that I announce a donation received by the Munster Education Foundation in the amount of $200,000 from the Mansueto Foundation for the purpose of gifting the teachers of the school town of Munster. As you'll recall, Joe Mansueto is a Munster High School alumnus who donated $1 million to the Teacher of Merit Award that was administered through the Munster Education Foundation. Uh, how many years? Trisha, last five years, correct? Uh, while that program concluded this past August, Mr. Mansueto recognized the extraordinary circumstances of the past year and wished to once again donate to our teachers. His request was that we award all teachers who demonstrated continued dedication to the district during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The full donated amount of $200,000 will be awarded based on the number of quarters worked during the 2020-2021 school year. To qualify for a quarters award, you must have worked a total of nine of each uh, the nine weeks in the period. Each quarter's gift will be $209.50 for a maximum of $838 for all four quarters. Roughly 233 teachers will receive the full amount and an additional 16 will receive at least one quarter's gift. Teachers on leave and teachers who filled leave positions with us are included in this generous gift. The Munster Education Foundation is thrilled to be the conduit in which this gift can be passed on to our very deserving teachers. And uh, I'd like to echo the, the comments of all my colleagues up front here. Our, our teachers are very deserving after what uh, was a very trying year and remarkable work also by, uh, by our administrators in central office and the administrators in all of our school buildings. Uh, the Mun Munster Education Foundation meets again tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to hearing more good news from the MEF. And the only other thing I have to add is uh, I've been asked to serve by the Department of Education to serve on their uh, Sudden Cardiac Arrest Advisory Board in addition to my duties as a member of their uh, Concussion Advisory Board. So that, that's all I have, uh, Dr. Hendricks, and I will turn the mic over to you. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I I'm a little bit glassy-eyed today because uh, uh, for the last two days, starting with Sunday, I uh, was participating in my first uh, virtual conference. Now you can imagine this sitting, sitting at a computer for four hours as people do presentations, and I felt I could really uh, commiserate with some of our uh, students and teachers who do it every day, and I'm thinking, man, I have a lot of respect for them because it is sometimes difficult to sit there in a seat all day and pay attention, and I've been doing it now for two days. Um, but the reason I'm sharing this, this is part of a national superintendent's forum that uh, I was asked to uh, attend. And I thought it was interesting because it was, all of the presenters were superintendents across the country, from Florida, Tennessee, uh, Illinois, California, New Mexico, Washington, state of Washington. And it was, it was interesting because all of the things that they talked about are the same things we are dealing with right now from social emotional learning how do we do that how do we do it well how do we do it effectively how do we um, reach out to kids who are at home and those who are even at school and what kinds of things are they doing in fact today i sent out some um, some particular websites to um, our um, high school middle school and elementaries of some apps or programs that a couple schools were using just on social emotional learning supports. Uh, several of them talked about how to use the ESSER monies. Uh, some of them got a boatload more money than we did. I mean a lot more and we're talking uh, 25, 27 million dollars in some of these school districts. I'm not sure how they're going to spend it but um, we are going to meet in a, in a week or so our, our sales administrative team and talk about the couple million we received is how we're going to try to uh, spend that uh, those monies to best support our students uh, and teachers in our schools and a lot of them are talking about just coming back to school you know returning to school just recently I know we had a school around here just recently returned to school after being out of school for a long time and uh, I think the thing is that I feel very good that we were able to return to school in a hybrid fashion where we've had between 65 and probably close to 75% of our students come into school and stay healthy throughout. And it seems like when we do have cases of, of COVID, it's because it's come always after a vacation or a holiday. Uh, we had one today at the middle school. Well, it's just about that time of incubation from either the Easter holiday or spring break. So we're gonna, you know, every time we see these breaks and people come together for holidays, we start seeing a little bit of an outbreak. But I'm very proud of our, our students and our teachers who've come in and, and come, to, to come to school and work every day and to do their best. So I just wanna say 
I get it. <laughs> I've been getting it for a long time about how difficult this is to teach kids in school at the same time over the, uh, uh, through the internet and trying to be engaging. It is absolutely probably the most difficult thing I think some of our teachers have ever done. And I can't wait for us all, and I'm sure Ryan back there is probably saying, I can't wait for everybody to be back in school so I don't have to do this one way of doing it. Um, but I do think there's going to be lessons learned that we can do some more blended learning, flipping the classroom types of things that will make it more engaging for students being able to still utilize this technology. So I'm excited about that, and I think our teachers are going to be better able, after practicing doing some of this type of work, to be, able, to be more effective with our students using um, the blended learning approach. Uh, also, uh, we are moving along, getting, uh, as you can tell today, talking about the construction bonds and things like that. We're working on finishing up our plans. We've got the projects uh, being ramped up for uh, this summer for our uh, north part of the high school. Some of those classrooms there are going to be renovated with uh, new uh, HVAC cabinets, flooring, paint. So we're getting there. It's still a step-by-step -step process to get those done. And um, I do want to praise the board for stepping up and approving that resolution to oppose funding these vouchers and charters and I think private institutions. Uh, what people probably don't understand is a lot of these uh, outside of public school entities don't follow a lot of the same rules we do in public schools. Don't have the same account accountability measures that we do. And quite frankly, they're owned by people outside of Indiana. So our tax dollars are going to be going outside to New York or California or Florida. So they're not even staying in Indiana. And they're going to somebody who runs those particular entities. So um, I think it's important that we keep Indiana dollars in Indiana. Uh, and finally, you know, after Mr. Wells uh, recommended uh, us honoring Lois tonight, I'm just, I'm just amazed at someone who has spent 40 years volunteering to help out our kids in our, in our schools, and especially in our library. I mean, that is just amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. And I don't know how you can not appreciate someone making that kind of effort and dedication. And man, I don't know, put, putting her up, Mike, I, I, you may turn people away who won't because they can't say, I can't meet that bar. <laughs> but I will tell you, uh, this woman is an outstanding individual, and, and I think we all love her to death that she would do that. But it just says something about this community, that people step up, like Joe Mansueto, who giving donations, they either give it through money, time, um, their gifts. And, you know, that's the whole thing is sometimes there's ways, if you evaluate the gifts that you have, that you can give them in such a way that you can help our schools, our students, or just our community. And, we have a lot of people in this community that really step up and give and support our schools and our community. I just appreciate all of them, but Lois is just, <laughs> I mean, there needs to be an article about her and we probably need to do more than what we've done so far tonight, but I just, I'm just so thankful for, for people like Lois. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. Announcements, uh, we will be having a executive <laughs> session uh, two nights from tonight and let me get back down to the bottom of the screen because my screen froze and I had to reload here for our next uh, meeting after that will be May 10th is our next regular board meeting May 12th we have our ISBA spring member meeting webinar and then May 24th is a tentative public work session. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Okay, I a motion to adjourn. Higginson, second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Mr. Castro. Log out. All right.
Thank you all for being here.